Mr. Fisher, you may proceed when you're ready. Ladies and gentlemen, the defendants in this case went to that basketball game as a group. They attacked Eric Hood as a group, and they need to be held responsible for their actions as a group. Why? Because the evidence shows that under the law, they either acted as hands-on assailants, meaning physically striking, hitting or kicking Eric Hood, or as knowing and willing accomplices to the beatdown of Eric Hood that occurred on January 24, 2000. You've been given the instructions and we're going to go over some of them, but the law does not make a distinction between an individual who is a principal, meaning a person who hits someone, and that person that aids in the accomplishment of that goal, hitting someone. So a principal and an accomplice are equal under the law. As I stated in my opening, this case is about two counts of aggravated assault. Two counts of aggravated assault that were committed by five men. Now, you heard testimony when the defense asked Detective Santos, and they brought out the fact that two of the defendants in this case have pled guilty. Two of the individuals in this picture have pled guilty. And the state has the burden of proof to prove to you that the other three individuals should be held accountable for their actions and their decisions that night. Now, before I get into some of the facts and some of the um, rules in terms of the final jury instructions, there has been a lot of discussion throughout the course of this trial about financial motivations, about who said they were getting paid after this case was over, about civil suits being filed, texts in the weeks and days after the assault, about getting new cars, about getting paid. You as the jury are to decide the facts of what occurred on January 24, 2017, from the evidence that has been presented in this court. The evidence, which is defining your instructions, is what was said on that witness stand and what's been admitted in back with you. What attorneys say, be it in opening or even in closing, is not evidence. The other evidence for your consideration is the stipulations between the parties. You will recall the judge read a stipulation earlier that the parties agreed that Eric Hood suffered a fractured nose due to the altercation that occurred at the arch. That is evidence for your consideration. I highlight that because, again, things that were offered to you in the beginning of this case are not evidence. You are only to consider what you heard from that witness stand and the admitted exhibits. Now, Eric Hood was beaten that night. He was attacked. There's been no evidence to indicate that that did not occur. There's also been absolutely zero evidence to indicate that this was some sort of setup by Eric Hood, that he initiated his own beating, that he beat himself up. Quite to the contrary, he was beaten after running for his life from the arch doors that night. Again, there's been no evidence to indicate that Sharika made up the fact he was beat up. I say this because this is not a setup job. This is not something where they are fabricating the fact that Eric has been hurt and Eric was beaten. What Eric did that night was simply text a friend and went to a basketball game. The problem for Eric Hood was the Morris brothers, who we had a relationship with before, had an axe to grind with him when they found out he took it upon himself, meaning Eric, to text their mom. And then they took it upon themselves to bring their friends with them to the Arch facility to attend this <coughs> basketball game. And the state believes the evidence shows to send Eric a message, a message that ended up putting Eric in the hospital. As you go through the different witnesses to evaluate their credibility, and you've been given an instruction as to how to do that, do not forget that Eric Hood did not bring this situation upon himself. He was attacked that night outside of the arts facility. Sharika Sharad did not make herself a witness. She is a witness because of what she saw outside of the arts facility that night. She went to a basketball game with a guy she had known for a couple days. And then, unfortunately for her, he got attacked right when they walked outside the door. She was made a witness by what these defendants did. Eric was made a victim by what these defendants did to her. The actions for which these defendants should be held accountable are their own and for their decision to go to the game and participate in the beatdown. For example, to give you some context about um, focusing in on the issues of what happened on the 24th. 
of 2015. Think about a scenario such as this. You're on your way, a person's on their way home from work. They're driving home, they go through an intersection. They are hit by a driver who runs the red light. The police show up, they identify the person that hit them. It ends up being that the person that hit them was a brain surgeon and had a lot of money, and that person was drunk. The police investigate, and in the days and weeks afterwards, there are statements made by that person that say, I'm glad this person had money and insurance when they hit me. Now, whether you agree with what that person says after the fact, that does not change or give an excuse to the underlying criminal conduct that occurred, the primary setting off event, the car accident, the running the red light, the drinking. Obviously, that's not the facts in this case, but that is an illustration about do not lose sight of what we are here about. We're here about the beating that occurred on the 24th, not about the text messages that were sent two weeks after the fact, not about the attempts weeks later or days later to try and figure out what other witnesses knew, who was saying what. Again, as in my example, wealthy people can commit crimes as well. The fact that a victim knows that that person has money after the fact does not negate the criminal conduct. They still need to be held accountable for breaking the law. Now there's a civil suit filed by the, vic the victim against the defendants in this case. Again, there is nowhere in your instructions that says it is illegal for the victim of an offense to file a civil suit. The civil suit is pending. That is not something that is prohibited by the law to file a lawsuit. Again, I'm highlighting this because we're gonna go through the evidence and what it shows, but do not lose focus that what we are talking about is what happened on the 24th outside of the ARCH facility in the dark. You have a duty to hear the evidence and decide the facts from the witnesses who testified in court and the evidence submitted in the book in this case, and apply the law. So what did the evidence in this case show? We know that at one point, Eric and the Morris brothers were friends. As part of being friends with them, you heard from Eric Hood. You also were around Julius Kane, who's second from the left depicted in this picture, as identified by Eric Hood. They spent a lot of time together meaning Mr. Hood and the twins in college. We know that the Morris brothers had a falling out with the victim years before January 24, 2015. And we know based on Eric's testimony that Cain was somewhat in the middle of that in terms of he was aware of the text and was aware of the, um, the fact that Mr. Hood and Thomasine had been texting. The victim testified to you all that he was told by the brothers, regardless of whether it was a text or a phone call, that they were upset with him, and then at that point, the relationship broke down. But then on the day of the beating, Eric Hood sent some text messages to Thomasine Morris. Those texts have been admitted to you. He tells her where he is, and she tells him she's with the boys, and it's roughly around 5.43 p.m. Within two hours of those texts, Eric would be beaten, his nose broken, 911 would be called, and the victim would be being rolled in in a wheelchair into the hospital. Remember, as I said, the evidence of a fracture, the parties have agreed that a fracture occurred. There are a lot of other elements as to whether or not these defendants should be held accountable, meaning whether they knowingly cause it or were accomplices. But one of the elements for one of the aggravated assaults is that a fracture occurred. And the judge read you a stipulation that on that day, Eric Hood suffered a nose fracture. So again, Eric's at the arch, and he ends up in the hospital with a broken nose. And what did he do to deserve this? Eric simply texted a friend and went to a basketball game. Again, you'll be able to view these texts and the timing of these texts given what we know about the 911 calls later, as well as when the game started. He texts Thomasine e. Morris to let her know where he is. And the text from her response indicate she was at home with her boys. Now, the 
evidence has shown that Eric had no idea that sending that text would trigger a response that would put him in the hospital. Going to a basketball game was not a unique experience for Eric, outside of what occurred after the game. Now, you heard how he arrived at the game that night, and initially he was by himself. You'll have the opportunity to view the video, and if you want, you can watch the entire video. We did not play that all for you. Um, but you can knock yourselves out watching the entire basketball game video if you want. There are still frame images that I'm showing you now, but certain times are relevant. Eric told you he showed up by himself, and then Sharika Sharat, a friend of his, arrives. A little after halftime, this picture depicts the two of them sitting there. Now, he indicates, he being Eric, that five other guys come in, and he recognizes three of them. He recognizes the two Morris brothers and Julius King. Again, this picture shows the five individuals he identified as coming into the game with the three he knew. To be fair, initially Eric did not know the identity the identities of those other two guys. But this picture shows those five individuals as well as Mr. Hood and Mr. Rod. Now, forward. So, during the game, the game is winding down. You heard testimony from Eric that at some point he sees the two Morris brothers leave. They walk out the other guys remain. After the game ends, you heard testimony from Eric and Sharika that they stayed back. They talked to some of their friends. Friends meaning people that they knew from the basketball game, kids, family. And they waited about 10 minutes, according to Eric. After that 10 minutes, he walks outside the gym, and you heard from both him and Mr. Rod what happens. He's immediately confronted by Julius King, one of the five guys who was in that gym that walked in as a group with the other five. He's immediately confronted, and then there are statements that he makes. Mr. Hood indicates, Julius says, you know what time it is. Mr. Rod indicates, he says something, he being Mr. Kane, along the lines of, you know what it is. So then both and both Hood and Sherrod indicate the next thing that happens is Eric getting hit in the back of the head by someone he can't see. And all Mr. Sherrod can do is explain that person's in all black. Ultimately, Mr. ultimately that person is identified as Christopher Melendez. Again, you've heard names of people that you have not seen because of how the evidence has been elicited. Christopher Melendez is one of the two individuals that the defense brought out through the detective has pled guilty in this case. At this point, Eric getting hit in the back of the head after the confrontation with Kane takes off running. He obviously at that point didn't know who had hit him because he gets sucker punched from the back of the head. And then the testimony of Hood and Sherrod is consistent that Eric takes off running. Now, let's think about this from the perspective of two individuals that have no idea that this was coming. Mr. Sherrod has known Eric Hood for two days, three days, four days, not long. He goes to a game, and it sounds like, from what Mr. Hood indicated, he wasn't really quite sure if he was even going to invite her to the game, but she was egging him on wanting to go. She's not expecting any of this. He walks outside. That confrontation ensues between Mr. Hood and Mr. Kane. Then she sees Mr. Hood get in the back of the head. Sharika is stunned by what is occurring. And she's in a position where she can do nothing for her friend at that point. She now sees two males have physically engaged Mr. Hood, and now he's being chased. So what does she do based on her testimony? She sits there and she watches. Now you heard testimony from Mr. Hood that he takes off running towards the parking lot and he doesn't remember ever falling in the grass area. He says, I got hit at the door, I run through the grass, the place I get attacked is down further down the street. But ask yourselves this, Ms. 
Sherrod is standing there at the door as two males attack Eric Hood. She stands there and watches. And then she has come into this court and said, what she saw was Eric Hood run towards the grass and then fall down. And then she saw a group of those two and three other individuals who she identified hitting and kicking Eric Hood. Now, the different perspectives of witnesses at this point are you have Mr. Hood running. And as you can imagine, given what his injuries were and what he testified to in terms of what's in his mind, he's trying to get away. Ms. Sherrod is just standing there. And then at that point, according to her, after seeing all five individuals descend on Eric, she goes and does the one thing she can do, run and go get help. She runs into the gym and alerts Coach Miller and Hall. It is imperative when you are evaluating what people saw that you understand the concept of time and reaction here. Coach Miller and Coach Halal do not come outside the gym, do not leave their office to see what's outside until Ms. Sherrod comes in to get them. So to say that Ms. Sherrod's testimony is completely incompatible with Coach Miller or Coach Halal is the furthest thing from the truth. If you consider the fact that, well, yeah, they're not going to have seen anything until she comes and gets them. And she reports seeing those five guys descend and hit Eric before she goes to get them. <clears throat> Miller and Halal have no idea what is going outside, going on outside until they walk out that door. And you heard both of them indicate that. Coach Halal, when he was asked, did you see what was going on outside that door before Ms. Sherrod came in? And he reluctantly said, no, he did not. So after Sharika comes in and gets the two coaches, you heard from both of them when they came outside Miller and Halal. You heard from Miller that he believed, based on what Ms. Sherrod had said and I guess just viewing her reactions, because he told you what he said, there's a fight, there's a fight. He thought he was going to be seeing something immediately outside the door area. But he told you, that's not the case. He comes out and there's nothing going on right outside the door. He indicates to you in his testimony that he then looks around, and what does he see? He sees an individual, I don't know if this laser pointer is going to work, and I might have just broken the thing. He indicates, Coach Miller, that when he comes out, the door is up here, and his exhibit is marked and fitted, but I'm not going to switch between technology because that can keep us here in the next week. Um, he indicates that the Morris brother that he sees down by the car is over in this area right here. That is an important fact if you consider some of the other things that Coach Miller is telling you. If you recall, Coach Miller said he was outside on the phone when he saw the Morris brothers arrive to the game initially. And he showed you where he saw them park. And that was up over in this area. So Coach Miller was asked, based on what you saw at that point, someone had moved that car. Someone had moved the Morris Brothers car down into this area between the time they went into that game and the time they left that game. Now he sees the Morris brother down there. And you heard his testimony. He can't tell the difference between the two of them. It was only later that he learned information during the context of conversations with those two and then Coach Halal that he believes that person to be Marquise Morris. So what does he do? He yells out, hey Morris, what's going on? Now what does that Morris brother do according to Coach Miller? He looks and he turns directly towards the coach because if if you recall Coach Miller's testimony, he said when he walks out, he sees that Morris brother. That Morris brother is facing towards the direction down towards this gate. Now, Coach Miller doesn't know what's going on at the gate at that point because you can't see from this door all the way down to the gate. But he was clear in his testimony that 
The individual identified as Markeith Morris is parked over here looking this direction when he comes out and says, hey Morris, what's going on? So what does that Morris brother do? Well, he doesn't come and talk to the coach and he doesn't simply walk away or get in his car. He takes off jogging down the street towards where eventually Coach Miller comes and sees Eric Hood is being beat. When they run down there and Coach Miller gets down there, that's when the discussion occurs where that twin, later identified as Marquise Morris, says, nothing's going on down here in response to Coach Miller saying, hey, what's going on? You heard Coach Miller say that as they're, as they're having this exchange, he sees three individuals kicking and striking Eric Hood. Now, the timing of this is, is based on Coach Miller's recollection. He indicates that around this time that they're having this conversation, the beating stops. But you heard from Coach Miller that when he gets down here to talk to the twin, Marquise Morris, it is clear that someone is getting beat up. He just doesn't know who this is. And it was definitely clear something is going on here despite what Marquise Morris told him. Now, you're going to hear from the defense attorneys in this case, and you're going to hear again from the prosecution, Mr. Bailey, later. Uh, and the state has the burden of proof, and that is proof that leaves you firmly convinced of the defendant's guilt. And we're going to get to the elements of this crime shortly. And we embrace that burden, and we think we have met that burden. The defense may argue that Markeith is under no obligation when he comes down there to <coughs> render aid, to break up that fight. I have nothing to disagree with that. I, I would concede that he's under no obligation at that point to break up a fight. But his evidence and actions that day, not just from what he says there, but from the moving of the car down to here to the running down to here indicates what his intent was. And from the state's perspective, I think is telling information that Markeith Morris is an accomplice to this underlying assault. And we're gonna get into explaining accomplice liability a little bit later. But this individual, Markeith, is in a position, he's moved from the gate down to here. And he's watching, ultimately, what turns out to be the beating of Eric Hood. The state's position is that Markeith Morris, at that point, is acting as a lookout to what is going on down the street. The circumstantial evidence indicates that he's the one that moves the car down here. He's the one that runs down here when help comes out. And again, he's not under any obligation to help himself, but it is against the law to attempt to aid in the commission of any of these two offenses, the beating of Eric Hood, either by breaking his nose or by beating him when he's down. If you knowingly and willfully aid someone in carrying that out, you're an accomplice and you're just as guilty as if you had administered the kick that broke his nose. There is a reason, ladies and gentlemen, why the beating of Eric Hood did not take place. Now we got two controllers. A reason why the beating of Eric Hood did not take place in the gymnasium. One, there are a heck of a lot of people in the gymnasium. It is well lit in the gymnasium and obviously there was some camera footage in the gymnasium. There is a reason why when Eric Hood was attacked it was outside and it was in the dark away from anyone or anything that could help him. And the position of one of these defendants, Marquis Morris, right here in an area that would basically be able to alert whether cars are coming this way or someone's walking out of the gym. The state's position is that is clear evidence that he is an accomplice trying to aid in what he knows is going on down the street. And there is no evidence about a car coming out and Marky stopping it. I'm not asking you to guess or speculate as to that. I'm simply noting the position that he was in and that if a car had come out, they would have to drive right by Marky Morris. But we do know what he did when individuals came out of these doors and asked what was going on. And he runs down here, down to the area where the beating's occurring. Now, once the coach 
temperatures come down, you hear that. The two Morris brothers and an individual, later identified as Christopher Melendez, walk away back with the coaches. You heard Coach Miller. He started yelling at them about telling him that this wasn't very professional. This wasn't. He was upset that this occurred. First of all, his game. But just overall displeasure with the Twins. He goes up and he gets Joe Murray, and they come back down. <clears throat> now, when they come back down, Eric Hood is laying on the ground. And you heard from those two individuals that Sharika Sharad had pulled her car down, again, down to the area where I showed on the map where Eric was left. And Eric Hood, according to the witnesses that are down there, can hardly stand. And you heard testimony from one of the coaches that he's basically crawling into the car, obviously hurt. And Sharika Sharad says to the coaches, it was the Morris brothers. These are spontaneous statements made by an individual as her friend is being scraped up off the ground. There's been no time for her to talk to Eric Hood at that point. There's been no time to fabricate stories. There's been no time to text individuals. No time to call people who aren't even present at the scene. And you heard Coach Miller. She said this like, I quote, 10 times. Way before the text about money. Way before she had time to even talk to Mr. Hood. Now you've heard hours upon hours of testimony regarding the statements of Shri Kishrod and Mr. Hood and how they're inconsistent and how their version of what occurred doesn't match or jive with each other. As I said, I'm not trying to hide the ball in terms of Mr. Hood is saying he never fell in the grassy area where Shri Kishrod said he did. And ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, if you do not believe Sharika Sharad that she saw what she saw in the grassy area before she goes to get Coach Miller and Coach Law. These defendants are still guilty based on accomplice liability, based on knowingly aiding and promoting and providing the means and opportunity for this being to occur. But I would highlight to you that testimony from people like Coach Miller and Coach Law does not conflict with her statements. They weren't outside. So it's really a call between Eric Hood's statements and Sharika's trying to match them up. Which brings me to my next point of a claim that Eric Hood is manipulating his story later in the days, I think it was January 28, four days later, saying that now he indicates I can't be sure Marky Morris hit or kicked me. A claim that he's doing this to try and make sure he matches all of the other eyewitness testimony doesn't hold much water when you consider the fact that Mr. Hood and Mr. Rod knew pretty much at the first day that they were talking about something that had they didn't have matching stories for. They were they had inconsistencies. She's sitting there watching him and she says, I saw him run, I saw him fall, I saw him descend on him. I come in to get the coaches. When I come out, go further down the road. And I highlight that because they obviously have different vantage points. They obviously have different things that they are considering at the time this is occurring. But the claim that somehow Eric Hood in the days and weeks later is trying to learn what everyone else is saying and modify his story to a coach that came out after the fact doesn't hold a lot of water when their two statements, Ms. Sharab and Mr. Hood's, have been consistent. And the state's position is, it's consistent because that's what she saw, and that's what Eric Hood remembers. But there's been no evidence to indicate that at some point, Mr. Hood tried later to modify his story to match Sharika Sharad's. Let me also address this issue before we jump into the elements of the crime. As I said, this case is about aggravated assault, two counts, on January 24, 2015. 
You are not tasked as the jury to decide whether someone, in this case Alonzo Hickerson, has attempted to influence witnesses. That is not a crime for you to render a verdict on. That is relevant evidence because it came in in this trial in the form of two individuals that rolled into this courtroom, Coach Miller and Coach Halal, and told you, this guy, Alonzo Hickerson, in the days afterwards tried to contact me and tried to convince me to say I saw the Morris brothers hit or kick someone. Both of those witnesses indicated to you under oath that despite what that person tried to do to them, they said, no way, no. And they came in and told you what it was they saw and what it was they heard. And ladies and gentlemen, as we go through these elements, their factual um, memories or um, testimony in this court still implicate these defendants as accomplices based on what they saw and the inferences to be drawn by the circumstantial facts. We're going to talk about some of your instructions and you get a description about what evidence is. There's direct evidence and there's circumstantial evidence. The law, again, doesn't distinguish between the two of them. Direct evidence, and I'm paraphrasing, so go off of what your instructions say. Direct evidence is something someone observes, hears, sees, sensory observations. Circumstantial evidence is something, a fact you can derive from other facts. So the classic example of this is you're inside a building, such as this, with no windows, and you walk outside the court, and the ground is wet, the building's wet, trees are wet, wet, everything is wet. You can deduce from walking out and seeing what you saw that it's highly likely that this has been raining outside. Now, you never had seen it, but you can deduce, deduce it from all the other facts. And that's what the difference between circumstantial and direct is. The evidence in this case as to what the Morris brothers are doing, from Coach Miller's perspective, again, going back to the map, indicates that they're involved and allows you to draw the lines between the two, the facts, the moving of the car, the blocking of the driveway, the running out down the way after someone came out to investigate what was going on. All right, let's turn to the elements of the crime. which are listed on page five in your instructions. As the judge indicated, there are two counts of aggravated assault, each with different elements. First count is that each defendant is charged with committing the aggravated assault as alleged in count one. Count one meaning intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly causing a physical injury to Eric Hood. So Eric Hood was injured by the conduct of the defendants. And the assault was aggravated by the fact that by any means of force, Mr. Hood suffered a fracture. So like I said, we know that Mr. Hood suffered a fracture in this case. You've heard no evidence to the contrary of that. In fact, you heard a stipulation as such. He suffered broken nose that night. Turning to count two, each defendant, again, charged with that count of aggravated assault, the state must prove that the defendants either intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly caused physical injury to Eric Hood, and that assault was aggravated by the fact that Eric Hood's ability to resist was substantially impaired. As it relates to the second count, the facts that support a conviction in relation to whether his ability to resist was substantially impaired. Go to Miller and Halal's statements, along with Mr. Hood's, along with Mr. Rod's, that the victim is basically, for all purposes of when Coach Miller gets down on that map, gets down there non-responsive, just getting kicked and struck by multiple individuals as he's on the ground. Now, turn to the next page, page six. And we're going to start to go through each of these counts as it relates to each of these defendants. Turning to 
to accomplice liability. I'm going to read through with you slowly the accomplice liability instruction. A defendant is criminally accountable for the conduct of another defend of another if the defendant is an accomplice of such other person in the commission of the offense, including any offense that is a natural, probable, or reasonably foreseeable consequence of the offense for which the person was an accomplice. And then it says an accomplice means a person who, with the intent to promote or facilitate the commission of the offense, does any of the following. One, solicits, commands another person to commit an offense, or aids, counsels, agrees to aid, or attempts to aid another person in planning or committing the offense, or provides the means and opportunity to another person to commit the offense. And I guess we'll go to one other instruction, and then we're going to work through these instructions together. Because when you're talking about accomplice liability, I need to highlight to you the difference between that and mere presence. Guilt, and this is the mere presence instruction, guilt cannot be established by a defendant's mere presence at a crime scene, mere association with another person at a crime scene, or mere knowledge that a crime is being committed. The fact that a defendant may have been present or knew that a crime was being committed <coughs> does not in and of itself make a defendant guilty. One who is merely present as a passive observer who lacked criminal intent and did not participate in the crime. All right. So, based on what Ms. Sharika Sharad said in this case, according to her testimony, all five defendants are principal actors, meaning they all hit Eric Hood, they all either kicked Eric Hood, they all physically touched and injured Eric Hood. She is the only individual that indicates that is what she saw. Again, the only two witnesses that you've heard from in this file that were outside that door are Mr. Hood and her. Mr. Hood's testimony is that he can only be sure four of those guys did that. And he identifies them as Gerald Bowman, Julius Kane, Christopher Melendez, and Marcus Morris. That evidence is pointing towards their guilt and responsibility as principal, in, or principal individuals who committed the crime. So when you look at the two counts of aggravated assault, it is saying a defendant causes the injury and then the fracture results. When you factor in accomplice liability, and this is a legal issue that I'm going to try and work through with you, you can be criminally liable for the actions of another if you do the things that are outlined in accomplice liability. Solicit or command another person to do it, provide the means or opportunity for that person to do it, aid, counsel, or attempt to aid another person in planning or committing. And if you're merely present and you're a passive observer, you're doing nothing. go through the defendants that are on trial in this case. As to Markeith, as I said, Ms. Sherrod says, she sure she saw Markeith hit Eric Hood. But if you don't believe that her testimony was credible enough for the state to meet its burden, let's work through why Markeith is guilty as an accomplice. As I said, based on the circumstantial evidence, we know Markeith moved the car down here, and while the beating is going on, he's in a position watching it down this way. The state's position is he's a lookout. He's waiting to see if anyone is going to come because obviously you can deduce by the fact Eric Hood wasn't beat inside in front of everyone that whoever was going to be beating up Eric Hood that night preferred not to do it under the lights of the gymnasium, preferred not to do it in front of a crowd of a whole bunch of kids and 30-odd 30, 30 some observers. When that person comes for help during the assault, Markeith is not a passive observer. He's in a position looking to see if anyone's going to be coming. And I'm not asking you to believe that because that's what I'm up here saying. I'm asking you to look at the facts and look at what he does when someone comes out to help. He moves from the position he had put himself in and runs down there. And again, he's not under an obligation to render aid, but the state would put forth to you all 
it is not a coincidence that when Marquise runs down there and turns around, and now everyone knows these coaches are down here, the beating stop. They did not want eyes on this situation. And that's reflected by the fact that this individual has moved from a parking spot up here to down here, and he's watching this, and then when Coach Miller comes out and says, what is going on? And we know Marquis heard him because Coach Miller said he turned and looked at me. He takes off down this way. At that point, the state's position is Marquis is aiding another person in committing the offenses that are down there, which is the second subsection, as well as providing the means and opportunity for this offense to be committed, the aggravated assault, the beating of Eric Hood on the ground down here, And I ask you all to look at the totality of these individuals' conduct on that night. So I am not up here saying that because Markeith said nothing's going on, find Markeith guilty. Nothing's going on is just an indication that obviously Coach Miller knows something's going on because they're all standing pretty close to it. And Coach Miller said, Markeith is closer to it than I am, and so is Marcus. So if I can see something's going on, a reasonable person could do something is going on here. And we know that Coach Miller says that after the meeting stops, which is pretty much simultaneously with the conversation they're having, the two Morris brothers then take one of those three guys that was just stomping out Eric Hood, Christopher Melendez, and they walk back up here and the coach sees them all get in the same car. Again, ask yourself, are these individuals that are just passively observing this? As the mere presence instruction says, they have taken an individual that the circumstantial evidence shows they knew was just stomping out Eric Hood, and they're bringing him back up to the car to drive away with him. They have a word for that, just as I've thrown out the word, um, a lookout. That's called the getaway driver, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not saying that there's direct evidence to prove that I can go here and hold to you that they all planned this together, but the circumstantial evidence indicates from Coach Miller, these Morris brothers knew Eric was being beaten because they were all down there. And then they take one of those guys, stroll up to their car, and help him leave that area. Now let's turn to Marcus Morris. Again, Trika Sherrod indicates that she sees both Morris brothers hitting and kicking Eric. She can't tell the difference between the two of them. And as I said before, if you think that the eyewitness testimony of only one person isn't enough for the state to meet its burden, which is to leave you firmly convinced of the defendant's guilt, then I would implore you to go down through the other evidence, look at Marcus in the light of what Eric Hood says. Eric Hood indicates that as he's down here, he tries to get up. Julius Kane is on top of him, and Julius Kane says something that is important. Marcus is nicknamed Mook. He's trying to get up. And then at that point, Marcus says, or sorry, Eric says Marcus comes over and kicks him in the head. Now in court, he said he thought he kicked him in the face, and you heard the defense attorney say, through rebuttal and through cross, his initial report to police wasn't in the face, it was in the side of the head. But either way, Eric Hood is telling you, I might not be sure about Markeith Morris, but I know Marcus came, because not only am I just going off what I saw, it was pretty much telegraph who was coming when it was, look, he's trying to get up, and Eric knows who that is, and it's Marcus. I will also highlight to you all the two individuals, Ramon and Jose, that came in here, who don't know anyone here. Um, I don't believe either of them said they knew the Morris brothers. And I know Jose said he doesn't follow basketball, so he doesn't know the media implications of the trial. But those individuals are over here. They're minding their own business. Don't know Eric. Don't know the twins. Don't know Mr. Bowman. <coughs> what does their testimony give you? 
Well, it, it tells you that Eric obviously ran down through here because they saw someone being chased. And there's been no evidence that anyone else was being chased and beaten up at the art facility that night. And Mr. Rivera says he sees about six to eight people running. And he can't identify any of them. But he sees them all descend on Eric. Now, the defense will get, again, the opportunity to talk to you. And I would concede that Jose Rivera is indicating size of individuals. 6'2", 6'3", 6'5", which do not appear to be the size of these guys at all. You are supposed to look at the evidence in the light of reason, common sense. Jose Rivera did indicate on the stand that the guys he saw running were all around the same size, the tall ones. There was a short one that wasn't included in that group. We know, not just based on Mr. Hood's testimony, and Ms. Sherrod's testimony that there were some tall people other than the Morris brothers that went down there that night. That Mr. Rivera is saying he's giving them a height of 6'2", 6'3", 6'5". Coach Halal walks down here too. And Coach Halal, you saw him, he's 6'7". So maybe Mr. Rivera is not the most credible in terms of describing height, and I'm pretty sure he testified to that fact. But again, what is relevant as to what he's saying is this is not one or two people that were out there. This is not one or two people jumping Eric Hood. And we know the five guys that showed up together that night based on the totality of the evidence and the witness identifications. Obviously, the Morris brothers were known to the, the victim, but Ms. Sherrod identified Gerald Bowman. And Mr. Hood came into court and indicated it was Gerald Bowman. That is the group of five people who were around Julius Kane and Christopher Melendez. And let me rephrase that. That is the group of three people that were around those two individuals. The two individuals, again, as the defense elicited in testimony, the two individuals that pled guilty in this case. So Rivera is telling you, it is not two guys. Now, again, the argument would apply about what occurs after the coaches come down to Marcus as well, about the fact that him and Markeef and the individual later identified as Christopher Melendez all get into the same car, which is the Morris brothers' car, and leave. Again, um, they are taking someone who they were just feet away from, stomping out Eric Hood, and helping him leave the area. You want an example of merely present? In this case, Jose Rivera and Ramon Ruiz, the two Hispanic men that were um, training over there, those guys are merely present. They're passive observers. And I guarantee you, based on their testimony, they had no idea that two and a half years later down the road they'd be walking into this. Let's turn to Mr. Bowman. As I said, he was identified as Sharika, or by Sharika and in court by Mr. Hood as the individual with the bandana. Both people, prior to Mr. Hood coming in and identifying the actual person we now know as Gerald Bowman, indicated that the guy that had the bandana that night was striking Eric Hood. Rika says it was by the parking lot. Hood says it was down by the gate. Again, If you believe the identifications to be credible based on what Sharika Sherrod identified in the six-pack lineup, as well as what Mr. Hood came in here and told you all, we know that Gerald Bowman is one of those five guys at that game. And again, based on what Rivera and Ruiz are saying, this is not a two-man job. It is a mob of individuals that were engaged, and we know the mob of five that were there. And we're going to get to this in a little bit, but you've heard no evidence whatsoever about anyone having a motive to tune up Eric Hood that night, except for these two guys right here, the Morris brothers. Now, the state has the burden, and I bring that up because in this case you did hear some defense witnesses. In terms of the testimony, reference Mr. Bowman. He indicated to you that he had text messages that he reported to be communications between him and a barber on the day of this incident. 
you heard from Detective Santos, he hadn't seen those text messages until the day that they showed up in court. You heard from Mr. Bailey's direct of Detective Santos that it's possible those could have been fabricated. And there is no direct evidence to indicate where those texts originated whatsoever, because when you look at them, ladies and gentlemen, there's no phone number. There's no names. The only thing to give those any meaning is Mr. Bowman saying, I know what those are, and they came from my phone. And I'm telling you the truth. You heard from the barber, those weren't his text messages. Bowman provided those. Now, the barber is saying that he thinks those look like the same text messages, but at the same time, they have no phone number. They have no authentication. Only Gerald Bowman saying, take me at my word, these are my text messages. I'm telling the truth. He was then asked questions by his own attorney. You ever own a bandana? You ever worn a bandana? You ever had a bandana? He was not asked by the state in cross-examination any more questions about the bandana. But I clarified with Gerald Bowman, you want these jurors to take at your word to believe that this is what you reported to be based on the fact that you're saying, I'm telling the truth. Well, obviously, ladies and gentlemen, based off of what was presented in court in rebuttal, we know that at least as it relates to the bandana statement, I've never worn one. I've never had one. And I would concede that there's no way to prove he owned that bandana. But that statement, to use words previous in opening statements, completely incompatible with the truth. So the guy that wants you to believe those phone records substantiate his alibi was less than truthful in here about a pretty key piece of evidence, the bandana. an instruction that's also given in your final jury instructions. This case is the state's burden. And even though, like I said, Mr. Bowman put up evidence, it's our job to prove that is him. The witnesses have made identifications of Gerald Bowman. Ms. Sherrod, and Mr. Hood in court, because he could not identify Mr. Bowman in a six-pack line. And again, there's no indication from the facts that Mr. Bowman was known to either of those two people based on both their testimony as well as Mr. Bowman's. But what his testimony did was give you an avenue to evaluate credibility in this case. And you can determine based on the instructions whether you believe his testimony was credible. Because the only way his alibi flies in terms of those text messages is if you believe him saying they came from my phone without the phone number on it, without any names on it. I'm winding up here, but with the burden of proof slide, it is not proof beyond all doubt. It is proof beyond a reasonable doubt, proof that leaves you firmly convinced of the defendant's guilt. <laughs> As I said, you have options in terms of whether you're finding someone guilty as a hands-on person or if they fit into accomplice liability, they provided the means or opportunity or attempted to aid as a lookout would, as someone who is helping individuals who just committed the assault leave would. You need to find them guilty. Now on page five, There's an instruction, and this is short sentence, so I'll read it. It's the motive instruction. The state may not prove motive, but you may consider motive or lack of motive in reaching your verdict. As I said, 
as it stands here, and we're at the close of evidence, there's not going to be any more witnesses getting up there. The only motive for what occurred to Mr. Hood that night comes from the Morris brothers, comes from the fact that Eric Hood had been texting their mother an issue that he knew they didn't like before. But that doesn't mean that if you do it, you deserve to get beat up. And when someone takes matters into their own hands and brings their friends to accomplish that, you need to find them guilty. Again, you'll have an opportunity to look at the text. This is the only evidence of motive in this case. <clears throat> there were statements made to you and opening statements about possible other motives, but none of that came in at evidence at all. And none of that, if you took notes on it, is for your consideration in terms of evaluation of the evidence, because as I said before, what I say, what these gentlemen next to me say, or what Mr. Bailey says is not evidence. It only is there to help you understand and comprehend the evidence. The relationship breakdown, these texts, and then the end result that night, all surrounds the Morris brothers' motive. Throughout the course of this trial, the individuals who were there that day, at least these three individuals, have been identified by the witnesses, and their roles have been distinguished based on eyewitness testimony, as I said two weeks ago. You're going to hear a lot about something that is basically an assault in the dark, a jumping in the dark. All of these other issues, money after the fact, bad blood between they help to someone interpret it, but don't lose sight of the fact that all of the stuff that happens after the aggravated assault, maybe gives you context as to how people are feeling, what people are trying to do, but the only individuals that said that they were at all approached by Alonzo Hickerson were those two coaches. And Eric could flat out deny that he ever told Alonzo to do that for him, you saw a lot of text messages from Eric Hood throughout the course of this case. And as I said, the state has the burden. And we believe we've met that burden as to all defendants. But you can count that if there were text messages substantiating that Alonzo Hickerson had set all this in motion, or that Eric had asked Alonzo to do that, you would have seen those text messages. You saw text messages and calls from Eric and Alonzo. Eric says, when I talked to him, no, I never said to do that. And those two coaches, they never came in here and told you, Eric Hood called me, Eric Hood texted me, and you might not like Alonzo Hickerson, and we might be casting a little too much judgment because Alonzo Hickerson is not here. Um, which again, I would highlight the state has the burden, but both parties have subpoena power to bring individuals into court. You cannot put what Alonzo Hickerson did against this victim. Because he came in and said, I did not do that. And guessing as to what those phone conversations were about is speculation. Eric told you, I don't know anyone here. I've now brought Sharika Shara to this game and now thrown this into her life. He called his friend, who was in Phoenix that night. The state is asking you to find these defendants guilty, not just, as I said in opening, because they acted like bullies, but because they broke the law. They attacked Eric when he walked out of this gym in the dark by himself, thinking no one would be the wiser. They beat him as a group. Whether that means that they were hitting him or whether that means they were up there acting as a lookout, we know that they arrived together based on Coach Miller's testimony, and we know based on Coach Miller's testimony that the two brothers took Christopher Melendez and left together. You've seen Instagram photos to show these aren't five complete strangers. The guys that showed up to that game are close. They're, they've at least hung out together before.
Arthur. And as Mr. Hood said, he only knows three of them, but Cain and the two Morris brothers go way back, just like they did with Eric. attempted to go hands-on and do the dirty work. The evidence shows that Cain held out to Mook, Marcus, and he came and kicked Eric in the head. Dave is asking you to find these individuals guilty because they broke the law that night. They provided not only the motive for everything that went down, but provided the means and the opportunity for it to occur. And as to Marcus, Bowman, Melendez, and Cain, according to Eric, they all hit him. And again, according to Shrika, everyone hit him, but specifically as to Marquis. If you throw everything to the side of what Sharika Sherrod said, as you feel she deserves no credibility, and you get to evaluate credibility, and again, just like you do with Mr. Bowman. Marquis Morris, standing up there as a lookout based on what we know he did when help came out. He is not merely present. He is not a passive observer. He is an accomplice. Just as much as all those other guys, Marcus, Bowman, Kane, and Melendez. Just as if he had hit Eric Hood, just as if he had broke his nose. And the state's request is that you hold these defendants accountable and guilty on all counts of aggravated assault. Thank you.